Welcome everyone. Uh, today is October 12th, 2019. I'm Dr. Terry Hildebrandt. I'm the Director of Evidence-Based Coaching at the Fielding Graduate University. And we're excited today to have Dr. Penny Potter. She's an alum of Fielding and she'll be talking about the complex, complex choreography of becoming a coach, coaching dialectics as a developmental path. And uh, this is part of our evidence-based coaching thought leaders series webinars, which we do every month. And we're really excited to have Dr. Potter with us. Just a little introduction, uh, since completing her own research training on coaching uh, in 2006, Penny has been fascinated by coaches' consistent descriptions of their coaching training as transformational, regardless of which program they attended and her doctoral research and experiences as a coaching instructor, Penny continues to ask, what is inherently transformational about becoming a coach and what is the nature of these transformations? Many have suggested that coaches can facilitate adult development. However, one overlooked area of scholarship is the coach and the complex process of becoming a coach. In this presentation, Penny will present the findings of her mixed methods study of coaching students who completed a six month coaching program. She will also describe coaching dialectics model derived from several theorists to explain the complexity of coaching and which may provide a clue to this overlooked developmental path. So thank you, Dr. Potter, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Terry, and thank you all for attending on a on a Saturday I, out here on the e East Coast in Washington, D.C. It's a pretty beautiful day, so if there's anybody from the, taking time out on a beautiful day, I really appreciate it. So uh, I'm going to, during this presentation, I'm going to, oh, there we go. I'm going to, to briefly describe the research, what kind of led to it, the high level findings. Um, then I'd like to open it up for, you know, I'll share some of the new questions that I'm in and open it up for discussion. Although feel free to, to pop in um, on the chat or uh, if, if you have a, some questions along the way. And then at the end, I'll share the um, coaching dialectics model. It's a little dense, and but it might get to my my hypothesis is that it helps explain why um, coaching tends to um, stretch people in really unique transformative ways. All right, so. In a single coaching session, a coach artfully co coordinates a complex set of skills that come together in an improvisational, conversational dance with a client. As I, you know, I actually wrote an entire paragraph in my um, dissertation describing everything that's going on with the coach during a conversation, you know, generally speaking. And it, it it was only in that moment that I realized, wow, there is so much going on that we learn to do, and then that becomes this tacit knowledge that we just, you know, execute like like an artful dancer. But in the beginning, I remember, you know, it felt a bit clunky when I was starting out, and then since then, as an instructor, I've seen people go through this struggle of letting go of old ways of being and taking on new ways of being in conversation with others. So th that was kind of, that's kind of the basis for, for my research and ongoing work. So I'm gonna briefly describe this study. Um, I became curious and I, I've been in this question before I even, um, uh, entered the fielding PhD program because I've, I've been curious because all, almost all the coaches I speak with say their training was transformational in some way no matter what program they went through 
And that was really, really curious to me, like, what's going on there? Because I don't hear that so consistently from other types of training. So I explored the meaning behind, you know, these, is, is this an it just anecdotal feel good stuff, something about coaching, uh, or is there something um, structural going on? So I'm, I had three questions. I'm only going to talk about two. Uh, my other, um, well, and my other question was, is there a correlation between um, transformational learning and hierarchical or complex, uh, structural complexity development? Um, and I found some interesting results that need to be explored further if, but it, it, that was less interesting to me. So I'm just going to talk about these two. So does participating in coach, tra uh, coach training program result in transformative learning outcomes? Do participants, hierarchical complexity, also known as adult development, um, levels change over the course of a program? So, uh, so, so here are some uh, definitions. And I actually came up, I was so surprised to find out how many different definitions of coaching there are. And um, none of them quite seem to fit what I was up to. So uh, I actually created my own definition as an intentional conversational process in which the coach uses inquiry, feedback, and resources in support of the client's self-directed learning, self-awareness, capacity to manage relationships and navigate environments. Transformational learning, for those of you who have not uh, been exposed to that, um, is, is described as a process, and this can happen, you know, in any sort of um, experience in which one confronts something that's limiting somehow, somehow they don't have the capacity for understanding and have to disassemble their current understanding in order to construct a new structure. Um, and like all transformation, like uh, from a caterpillar to a butterfly, from a tadpole to a frog, um, it's not just knowing more, it's a new way of understanding. Um, and then hierarchical complexity, structural development, this is one, um, one area, the Neo-Piagetian um, strain of adult development, which is a little bit different from the cook Bruder, um, uh strain, but it's a serial, what, I'm, what I was looking at was, do their cognitive structures change in a more complex way. And, um, and measure, I wanted to measure it because I did run across a couple studies that just like four other studies on coaches, coaching students and, and how their training changed them. And uh, so these are, three literatures I started with, and then I found that the transformative learning literature was a little bit limiting for what I was looking at, and so I added experiential and conversational learning, which is an, um, a product, a byproduct, a subgroup of experiential learning, and I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. So the four studies that existed before I, I that I could find before uh, before I did this research uh, was on the impact of coach training on participants. And what was interesting is two of these studies were um, one study was in India uh, on leaders who became coaches. Another study was in South Africa of of folks who went through a coach training program, and then the other two were in um, North America, and, and they had overlapping findings. Um, greater self-awareness, new perspectives, better interpersonal skills, that, that was a consistent theme, 
improved relationships, increased reflective learning, and increased decision making in complex situations. Uh, that was a finding by our own um, Campone from Fielding. So who participated in this? Well, this is the, one of the limitations of my study is uh, I got 10 volunteers, which was really surprising to me. And it was mostly my fault um, from Georgetown University's six month leadership uh, coaching program. I was so determined not to be an influence and because I'm an alumna of that program, um, I had the director you know, make the announcement, put it out there. I didn't come and try to recruit. I was worried because I had, you know, some um, some kind of reputation with that with um, the the community. I didn't want to influence or make them feel like that was going to have an influence in how they experienced the pro their program or performed. A lot of times in the beginning of a program, people are so focused on their performance and getting it right. And uh, so I think I underplayed that. I, I could have probably gotten more volunteers. So that's a big limitation. And so I frame this as an exploratory study. I was exploring the questions. I was also exploring the methods I use and whether or not it was reasonable to use in other studies that were looking at, at something similar. So interestingly, the demographics match, align with the demographics of coaches in the United States based on ICF's um, 2012 study. I used a mix methods. Um, I actually use a, a relatively new instrument, the Transformative Learning Survey, and in that are, is an area where I could, I could ask two qualitative questions. The survey results, and there had not been, not been any studies published other than the validation of the instrument, it was that new. This, this, the survey results were kind of underwhelming. I mean, it did indicate transformative learning, especially in openness and self and awareness. Uh, but what was much more interesting were the answers to these two qualitative questions. And, um, and then to, to measure the hierarchical complexity levels, I did a pre and post using the Lectica decision-making assessment, which was, is one of the most researched and valid and reliable instruments that measures at a micro level. So a, a lot of the um, scales, the, the way of assessing adult development assesses at whole levels, and this assesses at micro levels. And since it takes, you know, two to four years to, to move through a whole level of intentional development, it's, it was important that w I was able to find something that could measure these changes on a micro level in a program only six months long. So the questions I asked was, thinking about your Georgetown coaching experience, describe any changes in how you think, feel, and or behave. And the second question was describe the experiences that contributed to these changes. Interestingly, they weren't able to answer the second question. They knew something significant had happened, but they, you know, they said, well, maybe it was just, you know, the Georgetown Pro, they really, those answers were not um, very substantive. The answers to the first question were fascinating to me. So the results, I'll start with the qualitative because I think that's more juicy. And then I'll end with the quantitative and then I'll open it up for discussion. So some basic themes came out, new awareness. Um, so it's not to, it's to distinguish between, I mean, many people come in with an, uh, an awareness. A lot of people are mature adults who are in their first or second career. 
So having new awareness is a little bit more challenging to get as opposed to say college students. Um, mindfulness was a big one, new choices and curiosity, openness mixed with courage. And I thought that was fascinating. And then authenticity, integration and connection was, was another. So here are a couple of examples of new awareness. And Keegan describes this as a subject object shift. So these, these things were possible, but, but that they were fused and invisible until they're not. And when they become visible and, and you have this new awareness, you can make decisions about whatever it is that you know, thoughts, feelings, behaviors, etc. And, you know, some of these quotes are just really interesting. They, uh, Georgetown has a whole module on the use of language and getting down to the, uh, to the conversational level, that which is often overlooked in, you know, everyday learning experiences and yet conversation is exactly what creates almost everything. And so they get down into some of the um, distinctions in language, which helped these students become more aware of um, language, what the difference is between what they call assessments and you know, facts and data, so, you know, stories that people make up, the ladder of inference, uh, et cetera. And then there's uh, new, the new choices. All of a sudden, it, these graduates were able to be more intentional in their interactions as opposed to just, you know, going through their day, challenge their own notice and challenge their own assumptions and make choices about how to respond. Um, Mindfulness, I often, you know, to coaching students, I often say that coaching is like mindfulness on steroids. So there's a reason why a whole lot of coaching programs teach mindfulness practices. That's to get, in my opinion, that's to get the students in, in shape to, um, to, do coaching, which is to be completely mindful. And I, for a second, I just lost my mindfulness when I saw the person walking in the background there. So, but being totally in the moment with another person, in my opinion, is a lot harder than sitting on a cushion and being mindful. And having that, um, being totally present and still be able to think and decide on your next move based upon how the person just responded. Um, that to me is um, one of the, the main benefits of learning to be a coach. Um, curiosity, openness, and courage. So what I notice in new uh, people in coaching classes, co coaching programs is First, they have to tap into their curiosity and find it because, you know, that's been a little beaten out of us through many years from grade school on. There's a study in which the difference between the amount of questions that a kindergartner asks versus first graders, the number of questions goes down dramatically. So we kind of have to get back to that you know, open, curious mode. And, you know, in order to find the curiosity, you have to be open to it. And then to ask a question about that, there appears to be a little bit of courage that's involved with actually, you know, is this right? Am I, you know, it, can I ask this question? So I thought that was interesting that that, that popped up. And then these quotes are just, you know, these are just amazing. And these are kind of on the lines of, uh, along the lines of 
conversations that I've had with, with students who have graduated from programs. And in my study, I asked them to complete these questions right after their, their last class. And they were still stressed out because they still had to submit their recording and their paper. If I had to do it all over again, I would have waited six months. Because often what I hear is, you know, after the dust has settled, after they've had time to kind of reflect, uh, much more uh, comments like this, many more comments like this come out. In fact, I, I bumped into a graduate of, of a coaching program that I was part of a couple of years ago. This was a year after he had graduated. He was a top level military guy who was taking this coaching program to, to check a box that, of a required training. And when I saw him, and he had a tough time in the beginning, but then, you know, he really came along and what we, what we referred to is got cracked open. And there's a moment where all of a sudden students will often go, oh, I get it. And I saw him a year later and he looked five years younger. And I said, oh my gosh, what are you exercising? What's going on? He goes, it was the program. It, it changed my life. It changed everything. He was 65 years old. So that was amazing. So these are nice things that people say, but is there a measurable difference? So here are the, here are the basic results in the, between the pre and post test. And I said that, it, that this instrument measures in micro levels. So the average change is a plus um, 0.08, which doesn't sound like much, but uh, what's interesting is there were eight people who had, who demonstrated a positive change. And keep in mind that um, they were in total stress mode when they, when they did this. So there's a possibility that if I had done it six months after their program, that it would have been greater, but the positive change was 0.11. And two people showed a negative change, 0.03. And there are you know, different ways to explain that. One is they were in a hurry, they were totally stressed out. You know, we don't always stay at the same level. And another explanation could be that when one is taking apart structures in order to put them put structures together in a more complex way often we experience a dip in performance and so that also might be a reason for the for the negative change it would be really fascinating to take several um tests in the, a year or two after people have graduated to see see the change now to put this into context, so this was a six month program, a typical change in one, after one year of college is 0.05. And that's at a time when most young adults are you know, developing pretty rapid, rapidly. So as an exploratory study, this was promising. It's not conclusive, there weren't enough um, participants but it was promising and points the way for future studies. So at this point, I'd, I'd be interested, before I get into the uh, dialectical model, I'd be interested to hear, um, you know, what people's thoughts are about this. I know we have several, I know we have several um, faculty who are on this call who have maybe seen some of this taking place in real time. Yes, if you have uh, any thoughts or questions, uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself and turn on your video and, and join in the dialogue. Bye, Candace. Well, actually, can I ask you a question before oh, sure. I drop off? Thank you. Uh, yeah. I was just curious, in the beginning, you were talking about um, that no matter what program somebody attends, 
this transformation can happen and your sample is from one program. So yeah. can you just speak to how you came to that conclusion? The, that, that it so, wouldn't matter that, it, that it's program agnostic. Oh, oh no, that was, that was just before I even entered a PhD program. I, I know thousands of coaches and many of the conversations I've had, these were anecdotal stories. And I would ask them which program and it, you know, there didn't seem to be a pattern. So yeah. this was simply a hunch, you know, it was a hypothesis that I set out to explore. I see. Now I understand. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. I'll listen sure. to the rest of the recording. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for attending. Bye. Anyone else? Yeah, Penny, this is, this is Laura. I'm just, uh, you know, really, really thrilled with your research that you have here um, that in, in some ways is, is so confirming. And you mentioned Francine Campone, Campone's uh, research. Um, I've incorporated some of her research into the, the work that I do as well. Um, it, it just really speaks to me about this whole notion about when you have a new awareness, what that does is that it's, it's help, helps one be able to expand choices. And once we have bigger choices, um, then we can make different decisions or new decisions and have a whole larger um, expanse of capability to be able to respond. Exactly. Um, and I was just talking with one of my mentees uh, yesterday, you know, he's doing his, his 10 hours uh, mentoring for his renewal for his uh, his credential and it has been such a joy to work with him uh, over these it's been uh, nine sessions now over several months um, he's a graduate from our EBC program mm -hmm. and um, I just revel in the beauty of listening to his his internal process shift over time. So say for example, he has had some shifts about judgments within himself, about himself, uh, and then also a shift in some of his thinking of judgments and having judgments about uh, some of his, his clients. And, and through his own development inside himself, then this is helping expand his choices about how he responds in relation to what it is that the, the client offers. And it's just been beautiful to support this, this continued uh, transformation. So I just love what it is that you're, you're doing here. Um, and then it, it, secondly, it causes me to think about it from a very practical point of view. I work in organizations, as I'm sure many do as well. Uh, and to think about, uh, even when we do custom programs, in organizations to help leaders and teams and others take a coach approach. Yes. When you start talking about that, how do you have those conversations? How do you have those conversations about, cause they're looking for outcomes, right? Right. So with the right, right organization, I don't work with all organizations. I don't want to work with all organizations. I want right. to work with organizations who are you know, really looking at uh, making a difference out there in the world through their services and products, and they want to make a difference uh, for people in their organization as well. Um, but there's a, a starting place about how do you have these conversations? Right. So and, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts about that. Well, I, I did um, do an experiment with one leadership group who was very, very curious and motivated to adopt a coaching approach. They didn't have hardly any money. They didn't have hardly any time. And I went, okay, well, if you're open to an experiment, um, then let's play around with this and let's see what can, what might shift in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. So we did one full day and then uh, three subsequent half days. The three, most of it was just practice. Little bit of the upfront, here's what we're doing and why, and here's a little bit of theory. You know, they were interested in that, they're training and development people. Um, but most of it was 
practice. Just this was a team that had been together for a real number of years and they mm -hmm. were high functioning. Mm -hmm. They went through the same, the same falling apart and coming back together. All of a sudden, why can't I ask a question? This is harder than it looks, you know, those sorts of <laughs> things. And that yet, at the end, they were having, they reported having better conversations with one another outside of the practice. You know, most of the amount of work in, in coach training hap or coaching in general happens between sessions. Mm -hmm. They reported mm -hmm. having better relationships with one another, better conversations, more effective leaderships. And they were so excited they went out and created a community of practice with their, their teams mm -hmm. to start mm -hmm. spreading this, how to take more of a coaching <clears throat> approach, how to be more curious and open with one another. So that was, that was really interesting to me that in that short amount of time, mm -hmm. now sub subsequently they've said, eh, you know, how to, how to make it stick because it's so mm -hmm. easy. To yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm delighted to, to hear with what you're talking about in such a short amount of time with this particular group. Um, uh, you know, just such, such amazing results. And, and thinking about uh, this uh, recent group that I've worked with that I've spent about, we've spent about 30 hours uh, over, over time. Um, and for their own development as they're continuing, they on their own are uh, doing like monthly lunch and learns. Yeah. So they come back together uh, once a month and it's, it's sustaining so far. It's fascinating. That's great. And, and, you, and you know, it also causes me, Penny, to think about uh, some of the people in, in our uh, fielding evidence-based coaching program. There's two, two cohorts uh, that, you know, check in with me uh, periodically. There's about five or six out of these two different cohorts who um, they stay together and they have a monthly, one has monthly and another one has, has quarterly meetings that they get together to continue to develop themselves. They bring in guest speakers. They, it's, it's amazing. They, they stay self-organized because they're self-motivated to continue their development and to, to do it as a community of these relationships that have been, have been, been built. Um, yeah, so, so I, I still go back. So how do you have the initial conversation um, you know, in the organization? What are those organizations looking for um, that then we can engage in a conversation with them to mm -hmm. talk about some structures, including the this, this smaller piece, like you said, you had one full day and then three subsequent half days. Yeah. So yeah. How do you enter the conversation I'd, I'd love uh, to continue conversations in the, the future about that. And I think that you're right. You know, like you're not going to go out and sell this, but a, a, mm. a, an organization that's really bought into the effectiveness of coaching, that's mm. an organization. I'm talking with one organization that folks would be super, super surprised about this. Um, it's a government agency that is looking to develop a coaching culture. Mm -hmm. So they had already experienced outside coaching. They had trained some internal people. And so they're actually quite serious about this. So there has to be some, I think, my experience. Already in awareness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, some of the top leaders need to have already drunk the Kool-Aid, been <laughs> coached by a really good coach, and went like, this is great. So that's, that's my story, at least, Great. until it changes. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. It, it, just to build a little bit on what you guys were talking about, um, just recently, last month, we had a uh, Thought Leaders webinar um, from Deborah Hamilton, who uh, talked about how to develop a coaching culture. And uh, she'll be receiving the uh, 2020 Nico uh, leadership designation on Friday of, uh, of next week in San Diego at the Miko conference. So if you haven't seen that, I, I posted the uh, YouTube link to that recording um, in the chat room. So I highly encourage people who are interested in uh, taking uh, coaching into a, an entire organizational culture. She talked about that very recently. The, the other thing I just want to point out too is uh, 
uh, the previous issue of Choice that came out about three months ago, I wrote an article on coaching in all professions and how coaching transforms the way we lead and, and live and work. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, I think an interesting topic, right, to, to see not only uh, our coaches being transformed by their coach training, but I think any leader who uses coaching in their organization or in their work can be transformed and then they in turn transform the whole organization. So. Yeah, well that's what I, what, uh, is, is my experience as, as well over the, the years and with this particular organization I'm working with this year, it truly is, we are, we are, trans, we, we are truly changing the culture of the organization through the work that we're doing through the development of these of leaders and then also you know like hr support people in the organization <laughs> and three of our bis business leaders are from three different divisions of the organization and now they are closer in their relationships <coughs> which they hadn't been before and they're collectively uh, taking this this coach approach so it, it you know we literally have 50 percent of the top leadership in the organization um, wow! Taking, taking this this uh, you know coaching uh, co coach approach, and so that's what we're doing. We are building, you know, a a, a coaching co coaching culture, and it doesn't have to take years for it to happen. And, and yeah. that's it, you know, but it what the research that I've read, it does have to be uh, enthusiastically supported at the top with the top level leaders. Mm -hmm. And I think Nick. Nic is it Nicole is doing a coaching culture um, pilot in a state department now. So are you, what are you seeing, Nicole? Anything uh, yet? <laughs> yeah, actually I am. So we just kicked off the program in uh, oh, September. Uh huh. So the way oh. I have it structured currently, I have three internal coaches um, and then I have two mentor coaches, myself um, and another professor at uh, UC Davis. And um, we have, uh, you know, we've taken on the internal coaches and most of them have had no prior experience in, as far as going to uh, formal education and coaching, okay. but they're just extraordinary leaders. Wow. They're extraordinary leaders inside the organization. And they, um, they raise their hand and says, I want to be a part of this program. Um, wow. so it was really great. And, and so we've gone through the orientation. I did a two hour orientation just, just for the internal coaches, just talking about what coaching is and what it isn't right. And starting to expand their awareness. Right. Um, and then we've incorporated strengths into the program as well. So I just kicked off a, uh, four hour strengths training program with them as well. Um, yeah, and so I'm really excited. I've already got several other leaders who said, I want to be in pilot one and I want to become an internal coach. I believe in this too. So um, like I said, it's just in its infancy, but I've already seeing these just <laughs> tremendous conversations starting to emerge inside the organization. That's, that's great. That's great to hear. Well, that's so exciting, Nicole. I, I just, I'm so excited sitting here because uh, the organization I'm talking about as well, um, that I've been working with this, this year, is a government agency. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe there's something going on there. And then, Penny, I want to go back to what you were talking about, is that, you know, the literature says that it has to, like, start at the, the top. The leaders, right, have to have drunk the, the Kool-Aid. Did I hear you say that right? Or mm -hmm. that, Well, that's what, you know, I, I read a couple of articles that said that seems to be a key ingredient. There, no, actually, it was a meta-analysis. Yeah, um, and my, my, ex, my experience, and that also of some, some other literature, is that it can also start in other places as well and then influence the top. So for this particular uh, organization, this, this uh, government uh, organization I'm working with, we were actually, that what their interest was, was to, was to develop their, their you know, internal HR, OD, you know, HRBP staff, et cetera, who are now being expected to develop teams in the organization. That wasn't part of their role before, but it is mm -hmm. now. So they needed to have development about teams and how to coach teams. Um, and with that then, so this was just within kind of within HR. This wasn't the like 
top business leaders, a little from within HR. So we looked and said, you know, we could take a few more people. So they floated it out to um, the, you know, top number two uh, business leaders of these different programs. Three out of the six programs said, yeah, I mean, they, they didn't know what coaching was. There was just something about it that they said, yeah, I want to do this too. And was, was a four month commitment. Yeah. Wow. Um, but they chose to, and it was, it was transformational <laughs> and it is having a huge, huge, uh, uh, you know, shift in the, the culture. So, so I share that, uh, you know, with all of us to be thinking about, you know, that, that frame of, it's not just always, you know, we can only enter from, you know, say that top leadership, if you will, um, it can come in other forms that then it becomes almost like a magnet. It, so it was invitational. Absolutely. In fact, this government agency started many, I've been working with them since 2006 in coaching and that started, you know, just at a, at, at a middle level has spread throughout a very large agency over the years. They've seen and experienced the positive benefits. And now this one division is going, okay, we're going for the whole enchilada. But now they're realizing, oh, we got to get these guys up here to really buy in. Given the culture, if they mm -hmm. want to change the culture, um, it, it's going to require the top leadership understanding what, what they're challenging their leaders to do. Yeah, and a, a reframe on, on, on that in my experience, in order for that to happen, in order for them to get buy-in, it's really, it's creating more of a magnet. It's creating a pull rather than trying to go exactly. to convince them. Exactly. So, so, so Dr. I Potter, just, yeah, I just wanted to check. Uh, we have about uh, 12 minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, I think you have some additional content for us. Is that right? Yeah. I just wanted to very briefly go through something incredibly dense. If it kind of tickles someone intellectually, I'm happy to talk with you afterwards. But this is the uh, this is a, a, a my own theory about what might be contributing to this transformation. I think it's more than this, but this might speak to some of the structural development. So it starts with uh, the ex Kolb's experiential learning cycle. Um, when I went through my OD master's program, we used the Kolb cycle to write our papers where we would write about an experience, we would reflect on it, then we'd go to the research to make sense of it, and then we'd commit to doing things differently as a result of going through the cycle. We were never taught, interestingly enough, that it's a dialectical model, meaning there are these, these um, things have inherent tensions and what Kolb, once I started diving into him uh, and his work, what Kolb says is if you learn to manage these learning uh, dialectics or tensions, you get to more deep level learning, which is, was his description of development. So one dialectic is the experience, another, and its, its opposite is the abstract conceptualization or meaning making. Then there's a reflection, reflective observation, and active exper experimentation. And uh, you know, one without the other just doesn't work. One is all action with no reflection. One is all reflection, no action. It's like, you know, uh, just one side of a pair of scissors. And I started equating this to coaching and how we take our clients kind of sort of through these cycles, many, sometimes many of these cycles in one coaching session. And I have actually seen people with different learning styles emphasize one of these areas over the other. So that's another hypothesis I have. But I suspect that as the coach takes her client through this cycle and um, the, the client is managing these tensions and learning how to do that is a tension in and of itself. So then, oh, I'm frozen up, there we go. So then I added, well, okay, the coach is doing something. So I landed on conversational learning, which is uh, 
a theory that was developed from experiential learning, but it added some more dialectics. Uh, one is the doing movement versus being. And, you know, so it's breadth over depth. And a, and a coach has to manage both of those. In a, we have to move the client along, and yet the work is getting them to go deeper. We have to manage the tension of individuality and relationality. We have to develop the rapport and the relationship and yet be clear on what's my stuff and what's the client's stuff. And at the uh, right moments, speak up when, when we want to challenge the client. And then there's status versus solidarity. You know, too much solidarity you, either ends up in collusion and or if there if one person assumes a higher status than the other oftentimes my experience is clients come in assuming i have a higher status and i have to manage that tension to and really get it clear that we're in partnership and you're in charge you have the answer we just need to find it together and then I added one more dialectic, and that came didn't come from conversational learning, but I proposed adding another dialectic to conversational learning in helping relationships. And that came from uh, Mince's, well, Poliani, who was a, a predecessor of Schoen's, um, who talked about the dialectic of the rules versus performance and you know in coaching we have rules we have the competencies we have the you know the structure versus how to make that an artful performance and what mints added was in helping relationships what's between these two is productive uncertainty the not knowing the getting comfortable with not knowing and Mintz says we can never truly know the person sitting across from us. So we might as well simply engage with our curiosity. But that's not all. So we've got the client's uh, learning cycle that the coach is helping them move through. We have the conversational learning cycle. And this is where I ended up at the end of my dissertation. But since then, I've realized, no, it's even more complex which is the new version is oh by the way the coach is managing her own learning dialectics um while she is doing all this and being you know with the client and all this these other dialectical tensions so you know this looks really messy and like ah but as i put it together i went Oh yeah, well this is, it does look easier than it is, especially if this in fact is, you know, are the, the tensions that a coach is learning to manage in a single conversation. So that's it. That's, that's the uh, coaching dialectics version two. Uh, show again the conversational learning, sure. Uh, sorry. So that's the conversational learning dialectic, which the, the coach is mostly managing. And, and what I'm teaching our students, I, I am an adjunct faculty in an OD master's program, and we're uh, launching the first coaching for OD practitioners class this fall. And they're already familiar with the Kolb cycle. And what I'm helping them become more aware of is the coach if you're consciously aware of these tensions and dialectic you can make you can be more um choiceful and and aware of what you're doing is that helpful thank you so much dr potter Yes. Are there any other last uh, questions? We're beginning to uh, come to the close of our webinar today, but we probably have time for one more question. Hello, uh, Dr. Penny. Just want to say thank you for your presentation and uh, from what you mentioned about the students being asked about their thoughts after one year in the program, 
are you considering maybe making it a longitudinal study after their other years in the program or is there anything you would change about the survey? I would, I, well, number one, I wouldn't use the transformative learning survey. It, it, the, I didn't feel like that was useful. What I'd be interested in is having um, the students take a learning styles assessment um, and, and see if there's any correlation between where they're showing up as a coach and their learning style. That's one study that I hope to do sometime. And the longitudinal across many programs is what I would love to do. I just need to find a sponsor to do that. Great, thank you. Any and last uh, I, comments? Well, I actually have one last comment because, you know, this diagram is just really wonky and like, ah, but, you know, I did want to convey the complexity of what a coach does at the same time. I honestly feel in a very um, human and less scholarly way that the magic happens when people learn how to take off their masks and shields, you know, as Brene Brown talks about the masks and the shields, when they learn to take those off, first of all, that they have them, they learn to take them off, and then they learn to just be truly human with the other human across from them. And I think, you know, that's, that's the magic of coaching, and that's what I'm up to. Excellent. Thank you so much. What a nice summary. And we really appreciate you coming out today on a Saturday morning and to share your research. It's clearly you have a lot of passion for this work and mm -hmm. we really uh, thank you for uh, sharing that with us and being part of the fielding community and our coaching community of practice. Um, well, I, I, I appreciate you twisting my arm. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to twist too hard. <laughs> no, you know, do I want to talk about the thing I'm most interested in? Oh, sure. <laughs> so thank you. Wonderful. Um, I do have a few announcements um, for those who may not be that familiar with uh, Fielding's programs. Um, we have a, a year-long evidence-based coaching certificate program, and you can be a part of the community right now even though you may not be an alum or you may not be a current student, um, we have what's called the coaching community of practice and anyone is uh, welcome to join. Uh, it is an open community and all you have to do is go to ccop.fielding.edu and you'll see all the different programs that we have as part of our community of practice. And our goal is to share uh, the research and wisdom of our alums and students and other visitors who would like to be part of this community. Um, and we do that through twice a month uh, webinars, we have a blog, and we also have an annual conference. Our annual conference webpage is up and running. It is going to be May 7th through 9th, 2020, on the beautiful shores of Santa Barbara at the Hyatt Centric Hotel. So if you want to learn more, you can uh, go to our conference webpage, which you can get easy to, easily to from our main site, which is coach.fielding.edu. So uh, going to coach.fielding.edu, you'll see uh, our, uh, our main uh, links here to all of our different programs, including our conference. Uh, and our upcoming webinars are also listed on our blog page. We'd like to invite you to our next webinar, which will be October 30th on Wednesday morning from 9 to 10 Pacific. And uh, that will be our evidence-based coaching professional series. And it'll be regarding coaching clients later in life. We have a, an esteemed panel uh, of scholars uh, and practitioners from Fielding, uh, Dr. Connie Corley and Dr. Marjorie Wu and Dr. Lois Kahn Fourier. Um, uh, Dr. Connie is a uh, faculty in the Human and Organizational Development Program, and she leads the Creative Longevity and Wisdom Concentration in our PhD programs. And uh, she'll be talking about how coaches can uh, work with people later in life. We're very excited about this webinar. We hope you will come out and, and hear from these three scholar practitioners in a panel format. Uh, following that, we have uh, our own uh, instructor 
uh, Akasha. Dr. Akasha will be here talking about uh, pilgrimage as a model for developmental coaching on November 16th. Uh, he had a unique experience of uh, walking the uh, Camino del Santiago uh, as a pilgrim and we'll be uh, talking about his experiences and how he has developed his own model of coaching based on this experience. So we look forward to uh, hearing from you and uh, again uh, stay tuned for all of our upcoming events by going to ccop.fielding.edu and signing up for our coaching community of practice. Thank you for joining and we look forward to seeing you in a, uh, a webinar or an event soon.